listening to the podcast Advertising Playbook, your resource to better understand and execute successful podcast ad campaigns. Camille, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for inviting me. So you are the co-founder and CEO of the Human Group Media Company, is that correct? Yes. I co-founded Human Group Media with my husband, who is our chief creative officer. And Human Group Media is a branded podcast company for social change. So we produce branded shows for companies, purpose-driven companies, nonprofits, and thought leaders who want to inspire positive social or environmental change. Awesome. So I know that on the show, we talk a lot about podcast advertising. And I want to say that we've covered branded podcasts maybe like once or twice over Uh the years. But... Tell me a little bit about the power of a branded podcast. Why would a company want to create a branded show? Yeah. So there's still a a little bit of education amongst like companies, especially the institutional brands that we know and work with and nonprofits as well, because they're very traditional in terms of how they want to communicate their message. So when they try to do marketing, of course, social media has now been around for like more than a decade. But with podcasting, the intimacy and the authenticity of the storytelling that we are able to do through branded shows is very, it's vital. And they found a ton of value in it. So traditional advertising is great. Of course, the volume and the scale that you can do. But for branded podcasts, we're very methodical and strategic about crafting a show that will engage listeners and help them build a community. So yes, we are getting their message out. People are learning about the brand, but some of them are actually well-known brands already. But listeners do not know their commitment to solving some of our biggest challenges. So let's say sustainability, climate change, equality. Listeners need to know that they can trust brands. And so the podcast becomes a vehicle for them to learn about the initiatives, but also continue that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I have always thought that one of the things that were so important about branded podcasts is to create a a podcast that's about something and not about the company. And so I guess I'm curious because you are working on social change issues. Can you give us an example of a company that you're working with right now and the type of show that they've created and the angle that they've taken? Of course. Okay. I don't think we have enough time, but I'll give you a few examples. So we produce a podcast for MetLife that's focused on their diversity, equity, and inclusion messaging. So we work with their chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, Dr. Cindy Pace, to really craft a show that is not, of course, that'll engage their own workforce, right? But will help other listeners know that they too can be a part of the solution in creating inclusive workplace. So that's one example. And then we work with Ernst & Young on their show called Better Heroes, mostly telling the stories of social entrepreneurs and how each of them are solving a critical challenge. Let's say, again, I talked about sustainability, um, you know, environmental impact. We're more focused on storytelling and also expert-driven conversation. So the way we produce it is we try to understand what their communication goals are. We try to also give our own expertise in the podcasting world. Mm -hmm. So we don't want it to sound corporate. Mm -hmm. A lot of brands, I guess, older brands and global brands and organizations are, some of them are traditional in terms of communicating their message. Uh So our goal is to expand that and make it more accessible to like the everyday person. Right. So those are two examples, but I can give you a ton more. Um, No, I think that that's terrific. So I guess I'm curious, the podcasts that you're creating, do they tend to be shows that are for like internal use with like within a company's like, let's say they're just their employee base or are they for external? I'm sure you're probably doing both. That's an interesting question because all of our shows are external. Okay. But in terms of experience with some of the clients we work with, some of them came to us wanting to, because they have a bigger workforce, they wanted external podcasts. And then as we started talking and exchanging ideas, they then transitioned to an external like podcast strategy because they felt that 
the podcast could be a resource for other leaders in that particular field. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't be contained to the just the employees of the company. Right. Um, but of course, like all other brands come to us for, for many different purposes. So internal is one of them. But at the moment, our slate, they're mm-hmm. all external. They're all external. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So I guess the other question I have is that oftentimes when we're looking at podcasts, you have like that host that's really spearheading the show. There's a lot of passion behind the content that they're creating. When you're looking at these bigger corporations and you're trying to create that like very, very intentional message and very intentional story, I could see that being a challenge just because there isn't necessarily like that one person that's spearheading it. So how do you take something like that and not make it feel quite so corporatized? And so kind of vanilla, you know what I mean? Yeah. My gosh, that's a great question because that has become one of the main parts of our job to steer them in a direction where do we have a host with their personality that's needed for the show? Can we source that person? Or even if they don't have hosting experience, how do we train them to become the sort of constant voice of the podcast? So we do a, we do interview style podcasts. We do hybrid. So there's your uh, host, but we also put in voiceovers to make sure that we contextualize certain parts of the conversation because the topics that we generally cover are complex and they're very layered. And so we want to give the show an opportunity to do those explanatory sound bites mm-hmm. or voiceovers, if mm-hmm. you will, mm-hmm. and steering them in a certain direction is has become really fundamental to our job in mm-hmm. concept and development. So basically what we try to do is, do we have the right person? Usually it comes from within the company, but now we have really emphasized the importance of the voice of the podcast, meaning the host, or even if it's a narrator, should we go the narrative route, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because there needs to be more storytelling in here. It, it's not so reliant on... The, the banter and the right, conversation. Right. So identifying that has been key. Yes, I would think. Absolutely. And how do you work to integrate the brand into the podcast in a way that is palatable to yeah. and like actually gets that brand across? Is it just as simple as like this show is brought to you by Ernst & Young? Like, is it that simple or? Yeah. So, of course, like whether it's in the show notes or their logo on the artwork, which I think that's been standard Mm -hmm. for some of our clients, but they have given us the the creative freedom to be more strategic with brand placement and brand mention. For example, obviously, if the host works for within the company, there's always that intro, right? And they have to say that they're the chief XYZ of, of such and such brand, right? And then we do a post roll at the end to make sure that we say that this podcast is brought to you by this company. But the the main segment or the main episode doesn't really, we're not required in any way to mention the company. Mm-hmm. We need to get the story across. We need to get the message across. And more often than not, the mention of the company within the main segment is not needed. So in, in scripting, if it's only if it's relevant, if it's mm-hmm. timely. So we kind of consider all of those things. But generally, like for us, it's it's the post role, podcast description. Obviously, we need to mention the, that the company mm-hmm. is behind the mm-hmm. show. Apart from us being their producers. Right, right. And are you feeling like at the end of the day, the companies you're working with are feeling like this avenue has been successful for them, that they're getting to the goal that they had set. Yeah. Some of our clients are running on about like three seasons now. We we first see this as more of a long-term strategy for them or they see it as more of a long-term strategy for them in terms of the value. Oh, I can give another example apart from some of the shows that I mentioned earlier. We work with a nonprofit called B. So they power yeah. the B Corp movement, okay. if, if you're mm-hmm. familiar. Yeah. So... Our pilot podcast season with them helped generate a podcast partnership with one of the brands that are part of the B Corp community called Danone. So last year, we did a live podcast recording at the Aspen Ideas Festival. So because they already had a podcast that existed, it was easier for them 
to speak to another right. brand, another partner. Right. Let's co-brand this yes. as a special series. Yes. And that show actually got us a few months a few months ago or this year. It's March, an <laughs> Anthem Award for Best Podcast in Sustainability, Environment, and Climate. And so now it's an award-winning podcast for them. They've communicated to their own network and community that we know how to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And in this branded podcast did it. We've been recognized. And so that that's one example. And then there are many other yeah. examples of the value. But yeah, workforce. So mm -hmm. some of our clients might use it for... Some of them have thousands of, of employees. Yeah. And so it's a point of discussion for their like smaller, let's say, ERG groups. You no, know, their resource groups. So there's that. And then again, like just partnerships. And of course, people who are listening to it that have never heard of any of their programs, either leave reviews on the show or even approach some of our hosts. And so that's been obviously an amazing and fulfilling part yeah. of the job okay. because we know that we have been making an impact. Right. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. So the last question I have for you is who should consider a branded podcast? Like if you're a company out there and you're thinking like, hey, I maybe have had traction with podcast advertising. Like is that is a branded podcast the next best step or what are your thoughts? Yeah. That's a great question because again, you know, advertising volume, the number of people who are listening to it. For, for branded shows, I would say a few things. One is if you are, let's say, have an existing program or are about to launch a, a really important initiative that needs a show where you can actually tell that message more effectively and in a way that is where you can engage in deeper conversations that is authentic to the listener. Because obviously a 30, 60 second, 90 second ad could also be effective. But this is more of a, a longer term, right. I would say, strategy of building a community around that like specific program. If you're a company, if you're a nonprofit, it's vital. I would say because I, I can imagine a lot of nonprofits are covering very big issues or they're tackling like these really massive undertakings and a show, especially a podcast, is the perfect vehicle for that because it's about storytelling. It's about deeper conversations. You can invite, invite experts to your show. And there are so many topics and subtopics that you can tackle in a series of 12 or in a series of 16 episodes. And the more you gain listeners, of course, you're, you'll be familiar with this, right? Like once they hear your show and they know that it's a show for them, they're learning, they, they're getting educated, they're entertained, they stick around, right? I get, What I guess I don't have the answer to is why should they have a branded podcast? Yes. So I, yeah. I could go on to the top, but... For sure. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate your expertise in this area. Well, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work at Human Group Media, talk about our mission. And obviously, we're here at South by Southwest also supporting the industry. And I've met so many great people here. So including yeah. you, Anna. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thanks so much, Camille. Thank you. Mike, welcome to the Podcast Advertising Playbook. I'm happy to have you on today. Thanks. It's great to be here. So you've been at Ad Results for quite a while, right? Going on about 10 years. Actually. 10 years? It's going. Wow. And your company originally was acquired by Ad Results, correct? We merged our two companies together. Okay. So started a consulting firm and then branched that off into merging with Ad Results Advertising to form Ad Results Media 2016. Okay. And one of the things I think is really significant about your company is you're one of the largest podcast ad buyers in the space. That's an accurate statement. Yes. I, I quoted earlier today um, mm -hmm. that we bought over a billion dollars worth of podcasting ads, which is a, a cool, buzzy number, but it's pretty crazy to see how that piles up over the years when you've been at it for a long time. Yeah, no, absolutely. What I love about the ad results team is that you guys are a direct response company and that you work with clients who are looking to really see results from their podcast advertising. In an earlier conversation I had today, we were talking about kind of where podcast ads fall in the funnel. Are they top of funnel? Are they bottom of funnel? But really, when we're talking about direct results, you are looking for that bottom of funnel result really from podcast ads. Yes. I mean, we, we look at 
the whole funnel. I think <laughs> clients prefer to to see the lower funnel results. Sure. It's a lot easier to explain to senior management the success that they're hoping to achieve. Mm -hmm. We we have been seeing more and more clients though come to us with branding budgets. Those that are spending with a direct results type of budget, mm -hmm. but also wanting to move their brand dollars over to us. So it's been kind of nice to see people spending and they're they're not really concerned with what's happening. Hey, we can actually take those brand dollars, turn them into results mm -hmm. and get the good branding out of it as mm -hmm. well. That's great. Do you have clients that are buying both like branding and direct response? We do, yes, that are uh, same company and, and just coming, coming from different uh, buckets of dollars right. uh, within their marketing budget. That's, that's terrific. When you think about like the ideal client for podcast ads, as you are out there working in the field, are there certain companies that you feel like are a better fit for podcast ads than others? I mean, any company that needs to get their story across, I think is a benefit. If, if I have a business and I'm selling a product and it's very hard to articulate or explain, mm -hmm. having a 30 or 60 second message, uh, especially if it's an endorsement to explain that product, to me, that's a perfect spot and opportunity within audio to do so. Versus a banner ad, a display, or even a TV commercial, you can really have it come to life that I think can be pretty, pretty powerful. I think the other really cool thing is that while most often ads are bought in, in 30 and 60 second increments, usually they're longer than that, right? So we're getting like this length of time. And I really believe the host has the ability to very clearly communicate the message about the product and maybe tell a story. Whereas like you said, like other forms have to be so much more succinct. And so I guess I'm curious, do you find that often podcast ads kind of go over that, like that bot time? Yeah, for sure. Not as often as I would like oh, really? uh, or as often as they used to per uh, se. Uh, there's a little that. bit, a little bit more, more ad content in some of the episodes. But if you find that right alignment, mm -hmm. I think for sure. I was showing a, when I did my talk earlier today with Busy Phillips and actually looking to see that ad went on for three minutes and talking about, and it's just woven into the content and people are talking about, hey, receiving the product, experiencing the product, how much they love Thrive Cosmetics and really the ability to connect with it. It's almost, I don't know if this is the case or not, but in some cases can be like filler for the show mm -hmm. because you're able to fill up content. If somebody that has an hour or two hour podcast, why not have that ad take up some time and space? It's kind of a win-win. Right. No, absolutely. I totally agree. In terms of, I guess, testing results, are you guys finding that there are certain attribution partners that are really performing well for you? Or, or what is kind of your, your gold standard for results tracking? Triangulation, I think, would be the key. There are a lot of attribution partners out there. We work with them all. They all have their pros and cons. I would say nobody's really there yet on where they, they need to be. And so... We leverage a lot of old school tactics that come from radio, whether that's promo code usage, vanity URL, some really basic things. Another really big thing is just the post checkout survey, hearing from customers and them telling you exactly how they found out about the product and why they made that purchase mm -hmm. really adds a lot of value. I think attribution is great, but it's trying to compare an online and offline channel. It's not really capturing all of the demand in the right way. It's still using a device graph, not to get too technical, but it's still leveraging tools that isn't giving you exactly every result that came through mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't show how that's comparing to other channels. So we're getting closer and better. Uh, I now at least get to offer some uh, feedback as to how people can measure in a more technical way that they're comfortable with, uh, mm -hmm. used to seeing pixel-based mm -hmm. management, mm -hmm. but we still have a ways to go. That's so interesting. I love that you are looking at triangulating the results because while we see that Pixel-based attribution can be extremely powerful. I also think that there are some gaps. And like you said, I don't necessarily think that there's like a company that's totally there yet. So as you're looking to, to kind of examine those results and triangulate that, are you finding that that piece is really telling the story to the advertiser so they can feel confident in their their investments? Not completely, no. I, I wish it would make our job a lot easier. I go back to thinking somebody buying on Meta and looking in the interface and seeing the results. And it's a very closed ecosystem. They know who every user is. Corporate IPs and other things don't get in the way and, and, and mess with that data. Trying to then compare that to podcasting, it gets, gets tricky. Simple thing like somebody watching a show on YouTube because of a simulcast and, and we like to 
tend to call those a vodcast instead of just a podcast. Ooh, I don't know if I've heard vodcast. Yeah, we, I, I don't. I don't think we coined that term, but we can take credit if we need to. Okay, so do you find okay. that triangulating those different methodologies then gives you those results that you're looking for for your advertisers? I think it helps. As I was saying earlier, it's it's interesting when you're trying to reach somebody that's across different forms of medium. So if you're buying a podcast and it turns into what we like to call a vodcat, they're on YouTube, that campaign has dollars spent against it. Um, not everything's isolated to just one one medium. And so it's really important to kind of make sure you're looking at that. So we want to see the measurement of YouTube. That's not going to come through that attribution partner. Uh, and we really have to find that right mix to, to make it all go together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I love, I've never heard vodcast before, so I like that. The space changes on a, on a daily basis. And so when, when you have a video becoming a larger component and, and we're recording right now, and like we could have just been audio, but right. why not add video? And I think that's what a lot of creators and hosts are doing. You can repurpose content. I think it's getting more popular to showcase a show and you could put it on, on a, a short reel and really get some new attraction to your, mm -hmm. to your show. Yeah. When you look at advertising, are you finding that advertising advertisers are buying both the audio and the video? And are they are they happy like buying both? It really depends on the company. It's a larger company and maybe they have a separate team that's buying video or handling YouTube. And so silos become a factor uh, when it's a smaller company or one that has it all in the same team then there's less of an issue or concern there. At the end of the day, in my opinion, it's all influencer based. So it really shouldn't make a difference mm -hmm. when you get outside of the corporate technicalities. Yeah. I love it when people say that because I get so frustrated. And I, I mean, gosh, I've been doing this for eight years now and I feel like I've been saying it for eight years. Podcast hosts are influencers. So like, why do we need to look at it as being something that is so much different? Now, I will say just because you have a podcast does not automatically make you an influencer, right? Like you have to have a nice engaged audience, but there are definitely many podcasts that have very deeply engaged audiences and they are influencers, right? And that translates over into their social, that translates into their newsletters, it translates into their YouTube. So I, I think that really leaning into that piece, and I feel like as we're going, I'm curious what your thoughts are, but I feel like the next kind of revolution in podcast advertising isn't going to be podcast advertising. It's going to be more of that influencer-based piece. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, if I was starting a podcast, I don't know why I wouldn't have a video component. And I don't know why, because there's so many people on YouTube, why I wouldn't have that streamed all over YouTube. So you want to have as much distribution as possible. It's, it's really the content at play. Uh, and I think podcasting started before video was as popular and it was a lot of people that were maybe come from a radio background that also aren't used to TV. Mm -hmm. And so there's a really different dynamic there that goes on that I think uh, is just continuing to change and evolve. That is so interesting because really you're right. Like most of the audio in podcasting started from that audio and radio, right? And so like a lot of radio folks came over to podcasting. And I wonder if that's why they seem in some, some podcasters seem very almost video averse where I'm like, like you said, it's not that difficult just to record in video also. A lot of people getting started, though, were behind the scenes people. They weren't True. on video. They weren't. There's a lot more famous people now in, in podcasting. And so they kind of had that behind the scenes vibe. There's a lot of stories of people that were maybe the producer of a show mm -hmm. and they had amazing talent and skill and they were comfortable getting behind a microphone, but not necessarily a camera. And right. so now that's kind of anybody realizes that they want to make good I don't want to say a good living, but kind of create some notoriety and grow. Everybody wants to grow and scale their show. Mm -hmm. Video is the path to, mm -hmm. to being able to do that. Yeah. Do you think that there are certain types or or is there technology that is missing from the industry, right? Like if you had a magic wand and you could say, I think the industry needs this, that would really help with advertising. What would that be? I would need a lot of wands, not just <laughs> not, not just the one wand. <laughs> As I was joking earlier, we're still trying to define what a download is and what a listen is. And so I think we have to still start with the basics. Right. We're trying to put the channel in a box and yeah. it's a very unique channel and it's not going to be super defined. Uh, you can take the influencer space that I think is like 24, $26 billion in size. They have no measurement or tracking. Uh, we were talking earlier, radio has uh, 18 to 19 billion in advertising. They have horrific tracking. They're right. still basing it off of legacy data that makes absolutely no sense, yet it's nine times larger than podcasting. 
those data elements don't make sense. TV is not that easy to track also, but somehow podcast is held to this odd standard that I believe because it lives in that world of digital online and offline, mm -hmm. everybody wants to compare it to. And we used to work with folks that were with an offline background. And so mm -hmm. it'd be the offline media manager, or director or whatever. Now we're working with somebody who's overseeing a digital Facebook campaign or meta as they call it now. So that person is only lives and breathes digital marketing. Right. You're trying to get them to articulate and explain why podcasting. They don't want to hear that. They want it very black and white. And so you want to appease them, but there's the reality of, of what the space actually is right now. And I think it's also so difficult when we're not even sure who the buyer is that would handle a buy like this, right? Like because of that, if we're talking to the digital buyer, then they are going to want those digital standards. Whereas if you're talking to like an offline buyer, <laughs> then they maybe think about it differently, but do they have the ability to make a buy within the podcast space? So it just gets kind of convoluted, it feels. Exactly. So I'll have to think about the wand question a little bit more, but yeah, so we need multiple wands. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So in terms of South by Southwest, have you enjoyed the event? Do you feel like we were able to kind of maybe make some strides and, and just bring podcasts to the forefront here? Yeah, I think it's great. I've, I've been before several years before the pandemic and there wasn't much of a pod podcast mm -hmm. track at all. So it's great for this to be a first annual. I think it's a good building block. My goal being here and being part of the industry is really to reach people that aren't in the podcast ecosystem. And how do you expose them to that mm -hmm. in a new and positive way? Mm -hmm. I think the podcasting space is a very close knit group, which is awesome, but you don't grow it mm -hmm. if you're just talking to the same the same group. So a lot of new faces here that we've seen today and mm -hmm. a lot of curiosity, which is which is great for the, the space. Yeah, I heard you say that earlier, and I feel like that is so important because the reality is, is that as much as we are a close knit industry and we go to these events and I've heard people say over and over, it's like a, a going to a high school where you get to see other people, you know, that you don't get to see, which is great. Yeah, you do. But ultimately, in order to grow the industry, we have to have more people and I think South by is a really good opportunity for us to do that. Yep, totally agree. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being on the show today. Great to be here. Thank you for listening to the Podcast to Advertising Playbook, your source to a better understanding of the podcast to advertising industry.